Ghana. He addressed the nation last Saturday, the Constitution Day. Indeed, our Constitution would have been 30 years old. It's 30 years. And if it were a human being by now, uh, the father may be walking here down the aisle or the mother will be ready to receive their grandchildren. We are observing today... Obviously, because Saturday was the day and the president had addressed the nation and called on all of us to live and protect the Constitution. 7th of January, each every four years is when we also swear in our heads of state or president. Whether our Constitution is what it is on paper, but the reality is different, uh, we yet to find out really if... It has lived up to what we both or we all expect. At the table this morning for breakfast is the chairperson for the NCCE, uh, National um, Commission for Civic Education, or on civic education, some would call it, uh, Miss Kathleen Addy. Uh, she prefers I call her Kathy. So, good morning, Kathy. Good morning. Welcome to breakfast. How are you? Fine, thank you. How are you? I am blessed. It Great. is Constitution Day. Uh, obviously, it was on Saturday, but we're marking it today. Uh, first and foremost, uh, to those who uh, will not have so much understanding what the Constitution is, except that it's a document governments are to abide by, what will you say the Constitution is? Good morning and very happy new year to your listeners. Uh, I doubt it very much that people don't know what the Constitution is, at least Ghanaians, because... Um, We've had this constitution for 30 years mm -hmm. and um, proud to that, you know, we lived under several years of turbulence of attempted, attempting republics three times. That's why this is the fourth republic mm -hmm. because we set up a republic and then we have a coup that overthrows the republic and it happened three times. And so um, at, the, at the beginning of the 90s, we decided to um, go back and a fourth attempt at 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 a, at, at, a, at, a, at a at a republic, you know, and the constitution is the document that you know guides us on this journey of the fourth republic. It's the fundamental law of the land. Um, it is the law on which all other laws are based, and it it uh, encapsulates the spirit and the aspirations of the people of Ghana. So that, that is the constitution. It's a difficult thing to describe, but a people set out to be a nation and then they, they, they put out rules and guidelines for their nationhood. And then they set out um, rules of engagement, uh, how to behave. They also put in the, what they believe in, um, they put in the, what they aspire to, and they put in the, all these things and then this becomes the guiding document for, for the people. And that's what we've done with this Fourth Republic uh, Constitution, which is the 1992 Constitution, which came to life in 7 December 1993, because that is when the first head of state of the Fourth Republic was sworn in. Yes. Thank you very much. There are those who think the Constitution is their book or their law, mm -hmm. and we as citizens uh, perhaps would have a different set. Has the constitution lived up to its relevance, and is it relevant today? Okay, um, I think that today, if 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 you do not know what what we lived through mm -hmm. prior to the Fourth Republic, I guess maybe it will be easy for you to not see the big picture. But we came from a very dark and turbulent place, mm -hmm. and um, as a people, we decided to embark on this journey. You have to understand that um, the last thirty years, we've had. It's not a perfect country, but we've had 30 years of political stability. And if you've had 30 years of political stability, I think you can fall into the danger of think, taking it for granted, you know. But if you, if you, if you were um, old enough to remember mm -hmm. what life was like prior to that 30 years, right from independence, waking up to the uncertainty of a coup, um, soldiers going, uh, military personnel taking over guns in people's faces, and this happened fairly regularly, you know, happened often. And th that level of uncertainty and, and insecurity, um, at least we haven't had in the past 30 years. Also, one of the things I said in the, um, in the speech that we, we shared as, as a commission on, on, on Constitution Day, we, we shared our speech on Saturday, <clears throat> was that um, 
I think that because things are so difficult today in the times that we live in, um, it's very easy to say that no good has come out of this constitution. But I beg to differ, mm. you know, um, <clears throat> apart from the stability, we've had economic growth, our GDP, prior to the onset of this constitution, has risen, you know, very significantly over the period. It's not everybody's life that has been totally transformed. Sure. And um, I think that as a country, we, we, it's important to focus on the difficulties that we have. And it's important to focus on what has gone wrong. And it's important to continue to have discussions about how to right the wrongs that continue to um, plague us in our society. But we should never lose sight of um, the good things that have happened as well. And good things have happened in this country. So uh, <clears throat> this Constitution Day is particularly important because it also marks 30 years. And because it's, it's such a, um, a notable anniversary, it's a good time to take stock mm. and to say that, okay, we've come this far. Um, the Constitution has served us well to this point. These are the changes we need to make for it to be more effective for us um, going forward. This is the vision of the future that we are painting. This is the picture of the future we want that we are painting. We must adjust the constitution to reflect that future. I think that kind of analysis is actually extremely important. And so you talk about the, the, broad, the wide range of things, how far you've come, the good things, the bad things, where you want to go, what you need to do to go there. You talk about, as we sit here today, what are the threats? What mm. are the threats to the Constitution, to our stability as a country? Because um, the Constitution goes with the stability. Sure. So we so lose the Constitution, we lose the stability. Right. So what, what are the things that are a threat to our stability as a country today? Mm. So we, we like to have that kind of discussion to ensure that, you know, moving forward, yeah. what's the next 30 years going to look like? I mean, how many of us think of what's the next 30 years in Ghana going to look like? Well, uh, on the back of taking stock and also uh, asking if mm -hmm. we, we've been served better by the constitution or with the constitution, would you say from where you sit that perhaps the constitution has been fit for purpose, has served us well enough apart from ensuring there are no coups or unrests? It is fit for purpose. Right. You know, and... Um, I encourage people to actually look at it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a lot of people, very many people that I know, um, get into these discussions about the constitution. And then you find out that they've never actually even opened the, f the first page, you know. So it's fit for purpose, but maybe there are some things that need to change. We all, we all, we all, I mean, we went through a whole constitutional review mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. a very extensive process that, I mean, the NCC went round you know, engaged all people in, in the country, all levels, all strata, all demographics, different categories of people, and put, got everybody's views on board. Okay. We, we did a review, a white paper was established, and then, you know, we kind of got stuck along the way. So we can't say that there's no need, it's perfect as it is. Sure. I don't think we can say that because okay. all that has happened, and even recently, with the calls for the constitutional reforms and, you know, agitation for constitutional review and all of that. I don't think that we can say that it's a 100% document. After all, it is said that a constitution is a living document. Sure. From time to time, you must review really? and change. Because apart from everything else, your circumstances as a people could have changed. Mm -hmm. So you, you do the adjustments to, to suit you better mm -hmm. and to guide you better as you, as you go into the future. Your work may be cut out for you, given that mm -hmm. the constitution, as you mentioned, is a living document. Uh, have you taken the initiative to perhaps a second, take a second look at the discussion for a constitutional review, or that because we came to a halt, uh, possibly at nowhere, <laughs> we're leaving it there? Well. We, you know, for us, this is what we do on a daily basis. Okay. We, 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 look, we look at the Constitution and we devise ways of getting Ghanaians to understand it. So there's no way we have not been talking about um, constitutional reforms. Last year, for instance, we held several programs across the country, you know, bringing up the debate again, getting people to tell us again what it is that they want to see. Um, we had a national dialogue based on the constitutional reforms. And it was addressed by Justice of the Supreme Court, Justice, Justice Puaman. And we had dialogues in all the regional capitals. Okay. 
we engaged different um, professional bodies, the security services in, in, the, in the regions. And then later on, a couple of months later, we had a round table in our office um, where we talked about even an analysis of the white paper that was developed um, from, from the last review. And so we have a report of all of these, um, the outcomes of all of these engagements, which will be made public very soon. Will there ever be a day in the life of this constitution mm -hmm. when uh, somebody will say, let's go back to the commission's report and get to work on it? Is that something you, you're hopeful? Well, that is ideally. Mm. We can, I don't think that we can move forward with constitutional reforms without looking at the work that has been done already. It was detailed work. It was very good work. Mm. It was very productive work. Mm. So I don't think that anybody is thinking that we're going to redo that entire exercise all over again. But certainly we must have a, 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 a roadmap, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of next steps as to what needs to be done. You have to understand that our, constitution, uh, our commission has a clear mandate. Mm -hmm. um, we don't, we, we will not be the ones to decide what the next steps are. But our mandate is to ensure that people are properly informed, um, people understand the issues, people understand their options, people understand where we are coming from. People have the right kind of orientation and mindset to, um, to envision a future that is agreeable to, or acceptable to all. And then in that context, be able to decide that these are the things that we really like to see. These are the things that you know we can live with. And then we take it from there. So we take our mandate extremely seriously. And our mandate is public education. Sure. And so at any point in time, and we are going on with it. Mm -hmm. But as to whether the reforms, how the reforms, how the next steps are in terms of actually going through with the reforms is not exactly um, on, our, on our table. But when, that, when it happens, whatever mechanism is put in place to do it, we will work with that mechanism to ensure that the public is in, properly informed about the process. What will be the NCCE's advice to the many Ghanaians if, mm -hmm. uh, who think the constitution uh, affords too much power to authority, say the president, mm -hmm. and so for that matter, uh, he is able to do and undo. There are those Ghanaians who hold the view that some of that power should be clawed back. What would you say to them? Well, that is the view of the people, and it's a legitimate view. Sure. And there are many other um, views that people have put forward as to the kind of changes they would like to see in the Constitution. There's talk about, for instance, um, that whole thing about selecting ministers for parliament mm -hmm. should, be, should be done away with. My personal one that I, I really um, I really like to would like to see happen on a personal level is the election of heads of local government. Okay. You know, you know we, we tried to do it a couple of years ago and then you know it's, it got it got it was stalled. But yeah. there are so many of these ideas and that's why we need a process of sifting mm -hmm. and identifying what is important, what are the most critical things and also identify how we are going to do it. because you see the constitution has different types of acts. They are entrenched clauses and unentrenched clauses and how you go about amending those types of clauses is quite different but it's all spelt out in chapter 25 so the only thing we are left with is um the will the will of the people to actually materialize you know to have the political will to step forward and say okay we want to move forward with this um we've we've, we've identified these people or these institutions to set up a roadmap or there's a roadmap these are the institutions these are the individuals who are going to do so on and so forth. These are their terms of reference. Start, start the work. Talking about election of district heads, mm -hmm. this year, 2023, there's going to be uh, local elections. Yes. Is NCCE positioned to ensure educating the masses? Right. Well, uh, strategically positioned to meet the needs of the people who don't necessarily understand the process except that is they to vote and they go and vote well they don't go and vote and that's the main problem with the local elections well, because the local elections i mean for all intents and purpose mm -hmm. to many of us mm -hmm. it, it really serves no purpose but that is not true okay that is not true Educate it's not us. true that it, is, it serves no purpose so your local elections will elect your um uh, assembly, assembly, assembly members. members and unit committee members. Yes. And these people have 
roles to play in the community. A lot of times people are disengaged. Yes, we don't get to feel them. We, we see more of our MPs and our, uh, uh, what do you call them, uh, DCEs more playing an active front role than we see of our unit committee members mm -hmm. and our assembly mm -hmm. members. And that is what is informing the idea that they really don't make any difference. I think it makes a lot of difference. Sure. Okay. Because local government is, run, is not run by just a DC. Okay. You have a whole assembly mm -hmm. that takes decisions. The structure of the assembly is such that citizens can participate if they want to. And we really need to get to that point where people feel strongly enough about issues in their community to, to, to participate in some of the processes in the, in the, that they are afforded at the district assembly. Yes, we see the MPs because we elect them. When you elect somebody, you, f you, you, you feel like the accountability relationship between you and that person is stronger. So it's easier for you to demand accountability for them. That is why we must elect the heads of local mm -hmm. government. As things stand, the accountability relationship between heads of local government and the citizens in their district is, is weaker than between the citizens and the MPs because they elect the MPs. I mean, elections exist for, because, uh, for a purpose. The people come together and select you to go and do a job. They can hold you to account for that job. You understand? But if you, you, they, didn't, they didn't elect you, yet you hold the public purse, yet they don't have access to you, yet you don't feel accountable to them, then there's a big disconnect. And that is part of the frustration, I think, that people feel, and that is part of why people feel so disconnected from, from governance structures at the local level. If we elect heads of local government, it really would bring democracy to a, a life to people in communities because they get to then um, elect somebody who's right there with them, somebody they see on a daily basis, somebody whose office is right there that they elected, and who, who, whose job is there. The MP's job is not even there in the community. MPs right. come to legislature sure. in the capital. You know, so it's so important that, that that gets done. What do you think accounts for this absent participation on the part of citizens when it comes to local governance? Well, it's very intriguing. I have some personal views on that, but I think I'll hold on to that. It's intriguing. Yeah. With the first question you asked, what you asked was about whether NCC would be doing public education. Sure. Um, normally we do it, but mm. this, this time around we actually... Um, want to, you know, take a very, um, very strategic view and ensure that the education goes down very well. We think that it's a good time to get people to start thinking about these things differently because of what we've talked about, all the debate about constitutional reforms. If people are clamoring that we want to elect our local, um, the heads of local government, yet as we stand, the local elections, you don't even bother to go in. We are hoping that because of all these conversations that have gone on, the awareness creation will go down better. People will better understand what we are trying to do and then take this election seriously. When you elect people, you are motivated to hold them to account. You know, but because we don't bother with the elections, we don't bother with holding them to account, we don't bother with the assemblies, and we get frustrated, but the structures are there for engagement. We just don't take advantage of them. So maybe also because we don't know. So part of the job of NCC is to ensure that citizens understand how to um, engage yeah. um, governance structures in their communities. All right. Let's come back to the Constitution. There are some who think or even hold the view mm -hmm. that it was drafted to protect a certain crop of leaders at the time of its uh, coming into force. Do you agree with that? And if you don't, mm -hmm. what will be your word of advice to those who hold this view? Well, first of all, I saw clarity on, on this particular issue, actually, from somebody who was part of the um, Legislative Assembly okay. that put the Constitution together. And he held the view that that is not the case. But even if that is the case, does that mean that the Constitution should be thrown, you know, all of it should be thrown away because of that? I don't think that when, 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 you, when you draw up a Constitution and you make concessions because of your circumstances, certain types of concessions, that will allow you to move forward, mm -hmm. you know. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, okay. you know. So maybe they did, maybe they did not, but I think that we should focus on um, governance, you know, daily governance. We should focus on holding our leaders to account, demanding accountability from leadership. Those things, to me, are more important, you know. The past is the past, and it mm -hmm. fades away right. over time. 
the main players pass away, times change. Yeah. You know, we move on. You know, it, it may not have been ideal. It may not have been ideal, but it is what it is. That's our reality. And sometimes when you look at your reality, you have to um, draw a line and say, I just, we, we are moving on. I think that the, the um, national reconciliation exercise that mm -hmm. happened in the early 2000s was one of those exercises that was supposed to achieve that objective. Right. We know we had this turbulent past. Yeah. We know that there were so many wrongs. We know that so many people did not get justice. Mm -hmm. But at this time, if we are going to um, focus on that, we may, probably will never be able to move, make progress. Right. So at some point, we draw a line and we move on. Right. And that's my attitude towards that. Let's look at the parts of the constitution that affect us today. Um, the powers of the presidency, for instance, that you mentioned. It is a real, people see it as something that they find a real problem. Let's focus on that. Um, and by the way, election of local government will reduce that power significantly because the power to appoint over 200 and something um, MMDCs is, 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 is immediately goes away. Okay. So that uh, even that appointing power will, will be reduced significantly once we elect local the, the heads of local government. Let's look at how to make progress on some of these things that affect our lives on a daily basis. And then, and that is not to say that we don't recognize the pain of the past. Mm. That is not to say that we don't recognize um, the loss that people have experienced. You know, but. We took a decision as a people that we will take this path. Should we elect our MMDCEs? I think we should. I think we should, yes. And what will become And of... it's actually aspirational, built into the Constitution. If you look at Chapter 6, which okay. is the Directive and um, Principles of State Policy, you will find in there that, you know, progressively we must, we must decentralize democracy to the district level. Right. Yeah. And is it overdue? In, in, in the constitution to have that reviewed so that it becomes a reality and would not depend on us holding a referendum to agree or disagree. Okay, so on this issue, you know, the last time round, yeah. we were going down the road of a referendum. Right. And then we all know what happened. We don't want to go back there. <laughs> but if we want to, um, if we choose to do the, 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 you know, bring that on board, the, the election of local government, without doing it on a partisan basis, the whole exercise can actually be done in between the parliament and the council of state. That change can be made very easily. That okay. amendment can be done. Okay. So maybe it will be a good first step forward that we try and um, so avoid the debate because uh, apart from everything else, you know, you, you need to have a certain consensus amongst key stakeholders, you know, so you know that the work you're doing will be meaningful. Mm -hmm. There's no point starting a project like that and not having consensus. Um, the project will be bogged down in the debate and it will never materialize. But I think that at this point, there's consensus between the two major parties that um, the, 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 there's the desire to, to elect the heads of local government is there. I think the contention was whether to elect on a partisan or non-partisan basis. Non-partisan basis can be done mm -hmm. without a referendum. It's an easier process because the clauses are not entrenched. Sure. So maybe we should go down that road. But it's not really for us as NCC to, to, to decide on that. But I think that it's probably a good way to go. If at a later date people decide to, um, there's a, to have another look at it and think that, Let's do this on a partisan basis. Then maybe we would have had some, <clears throat> some practice of the election of heads of local government. And then if we want to add a partisan dimension to it, we can do that. Give, given <coughs> that the, the constitution in its current state or form uh, entrusts so much power into the hands of authority, political elite, to, to be precise, uh, how sure are we or how confident can we be <coughs> <laughs> that if we have to move for a constitutional reform or review, mm -hmm. uh, we'll have the support, given that there's currently a white paper mm -hmm. still gathering dust, if it is. Have you seen that white paper? I encourage you and all Ghanaians to please go read it. That's the first thing I have to say. That's all I have to say on that. But why would you assume that um, somebody has an ulterior, ulterior motive or somebody wouldn't want to see the progress that we all want to see? 
well, it's not an assumption on my part. It, mm -hmm. it, it, it is obviously from what we see. Uh, mm -hmm. If there is ever support for it, mm -hmm. then uh, maybe Professor Mills' commission uh, to review the constitution mm -hmm. uh, has gone through two differences of change of government. Mm -hmm. And by now we should see at least a move. I, I agree with you. I totally agree with you. Why it hasn't been done is really beyond my pay grade. Right. It's not something I can... <laughs> <laughs> I like that but, one. <laughs> <laughs> but just to say that I, I think that, you know, for, for me, mm. all of this boils down to active participation of right. citizens. We must organize ourselves. We must ensure that our representatives understand that this is what we want. Right. They must go and represent our views in the legislature. Right. <clears throat> and if this is the way we want to go, we must ensure that they understand that, you know, pushing this agenda is the will of the people, you know. But then the real problem is that how are we organizing ourselves how are citizens organizing to ensure that they are, their representatives understand this desire right. to get this thing done? Mm. You know, the, for, so for me, the, the, the work, there's, there are different levels of work, but the most important work is getting um, our legislature, uh, our representatives, and our government to understand that this is the will of the people, and so we must go down this path. There are, there are, there are those who think the 1992 constitution itself mm -hmm. should be throw out, uh, thrown out and a new one be uh, rewritten or adopted. Uh, By who? Well, <laughs> given that there, there's the feeling I mean... <laughs> it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, meet their need, and some people feel... Uh, discriminated uh, upon by the very uh, nature of the constitution and the kind of power divide it puts out there, they feel uh, it should be thrown out and a new one be drafted. So you said two things. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious. Cool. Some people feel it should be thrown out. Of course, there are those people. I 100% I disagree with that. So <clears throat> that's all I can say to that. Sure. Those who feel discriminated against, I, I want you to please expand on that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Those who feel discriminated. You yes. said some people feel the, the constitution discriminates well, against is, them. There is the <coughs> us and them view so that uh, in, in the exercise of even citizens' power, mm -hmm. you find some would even ask you, do you know who I am? But that's not a constitutional issue. Well, it, it is because their power, their, their who I am, <laughs> derives its power from the constitution. But anyway, there's, there's no, a no, question here. No, no, let me here. tell you something. Right, okay. Um... um the democracy that we are we are practicing means that we will cede power to some people to govern, right? That's one thing. That's right. a fundamental. The, the democracy, the structure of a democracy is such that, right. uh, you know, you, you, you cede power and resources to your elected officials and sure. you are supposed to hold them to account. Right. They are supposed to account for their stewardship to you. That is the basic structure. Mm. Now, if um, you meet somebody and the person says, do you know who I am? It's not a constitutional issue. Mm -hmm. You understand. Yeah. Um, so you can you can make you can make it about that. If you say that the constitution <clears throat> um, denies me the power to elect my my, my head of local government, now, that's, now we're talking some serious business. Right. So let's let's really focus on these serious things. Sure. But as for as for who do you think? What, what did you say? Who, who do you think I am? Who do you know? Do yeah. you know? Do, do you, you know, know who I am? am? And it's often that's from a, those who wield power in that's society. A, that's a cultural thing. It's not just the politicians. The, uh, all kinds of leaders do that. Okay. In that. Just a good oh, okay. I think, I think uh, we're, we're almost out of time. And so uh, before you take leave of us, what would you say to uh, the many Ghanaians who uh, still look forward to a constitutional review and still need some more education and understanding of the constitution? The education is ongoing. The education is ongoing. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's not just NCC. There are several other institutions who are undertaking all kinds of activities around constitutional review. Um, but I'd like to say a little bit sure. that about the threats that our democracy is facing, mm. you know, and what we should be thinking about moving forward for the next 30 years. Mm. I hope I have a little bit sure. of time. Sure. So because, sure. um, when, again, when we gave our... Um, uh, uh, information when we did that the the, the, the Constitution Day engagement, mm -hmm. you know, we we emphasized on the on the threats that we face as a country, and I just want to go over some of those things. The first one being Galamzi, and I see your bottle oh. of dirty water 
sitting right That's here. Galamse juice is not dirty water. It's Galamse <laughs> juice from the Pura River. I mean, I think that we are playing with fire okay. as far as the Galamse situation is concerned because, you know, beyond the, 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 the devastation of the environment, beyond the, the, the exposure to severe health, you know, problems, beyond the, 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 you know, the destruction of communities, we have the very real threat that the way we are going about with this Galamse business is going to lead us to war. Mm. And uh, people think that that's a bit extreme. But if you remember Liberia and Sierra Leone in sure. the 90s, I mean, we have a whole concept called blood diamonds. Mm -hmm. You know, that was illegal mining. That went out of control. And then warlords took territories. And then when this war started, the whole thing fooled. Uh, 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 the, the, the whole thing became a vicious cycle of, of extraction of minerals, of running of ammunition guns, gun running, of arming of, of civilians and, and paramilitias, and going to fight to, to, to um, safeguard the territories that they had carved for themselves. And, and if we go on like this, in this unregulated manner, already we are seeing places where people have you know, armed guards around, around their, their, their area of operation mm -hmm. for this Galamzi. And then they, 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 are, they are bold enough to even engage the, the security forces when they go and try and, 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 you know, do some work there. It's actually a very, very dangerous tra trajectory. And mm -hmm. we absolutely, this is a threat. This is a real threat to the democracy. Thank you. More than Thank you. election of local government. Thank you That's so very one. Much. The other one is the state of the economy, economic hardship. Uh. You know, when people feel that, um, that, that like you said, the mm. democracy is not, is, not, is not giving the dividends that they expected, sure. then out of frustration, they might be tempted to support non-democratic means of survival or self-expression. That's a big threat, yeah. you understand. Yeah. There are That's several true. others. Even, even uh, um, the loss of confidence mm. in state institutions is a threat. And I think that we must really look at these things and think about how um, we are going to resolve them right. to ensure Thank that you. the threat to the democracy is um, reduced. Thank you very much. That uh, is uh, Kathleen Adi, the chairperson for the NCCE. We've been having a conversation on the Constitution and Constitutional Review.